Hello and welcome everybody, I'm Rob Pavarian and this is Victoria 3. Today we are going through a part of the Q&A that was hosted on the Victoria 3 Discord. There were, I think, over 124 answers that have been given, so there's quite a lot. I sort of separated the most important ones. I put them into individual categories like warfare, colonialism, uh, culture, politics and so on. Today we will have colonies and warfare because that is just something that has an amount that I think will stay hopefully within like half an hour, maybe 40 minutes when I say that you know this video is probably like one and a half hours long but what I want to say is that basically they gave a lot of really interesting answers that are in particular you know quite interesting because they give more information on a topic that we already knew about and that is always something that I personally like I did similar videos with the Q&A's for CK3 pre-launch because there was quite some information in there that wasn't you know otherwise available and made it so that we could really anticipate the game a bit better really understand where the game was trying to go and I do think that that is important because other Otherwise, you just have a guessing game. You have a lot of speculation, right? So I like this approach. Today, we will have colonies. Colonies comes first. And then we do, uh, we'll do warfare today as well. I don't know when the next video goes up. Probably on the weekend. And there we're going to do, I think, politics. Something like that. We're going to take a look at that. Now, uh, let's start with the first question. What is the smallest province, population-wise, that you will represent at game start, as in being able to function within the game? A lot of small islands and colonies come to mind. There are, of course, you know, for example, in Micronesia, a lot of those cases. Giving specifics here is hard, because all numbers are subject to change before release, and feasibility of X colony, and that is something we look into. Of course, everything is still in development. There are certainly some colonial subjects in-game that have a small population and function with some employment, but you will actively have to court migrants to go any further. Uh, I assume that they might mean South Africa, so the Cape Colony here, they might mean Australia. I would be very interested in seeing the same effect for Canada as well, of course. Migration was very, very important for Canada at the time, which wasn't Canada, of course. It was not yet a confederation at the time. Um, I will say that this is a really interesting topic. I think we're going to see this when we get to the economy questions in a different video, because this is something that really hasn't been explored a lot. We have these migration streams, right, that happen uh, between different markets. We know that people migrate within one market. We know that this is of course a feature but what hasn't been explored yet quite a bit is the question of how actually do I get the right people to go into the colonies where I need them. I would like to see that in action of course that is a bigger topic. Um, ultimately I hope that we just get some more hands-on action you know but this is definitely something that I've also thought about and the answer right here is basically hey you're gonna see how it works quite right now I can't tell you. Now, here we have, will the African continent be better detailed? Uh, you can actually see the African continent in the latest screenshot right here in the background. Uh, in the last Victoria 2, borders followed along colonial lines with, which didn't make sense and gave them a sense of only existing as filler states. So this is a big topic because it effectively, of course, yes, as a player, as somebody that knows the world map, as somebody that understands what the colonial borders in 1914 and whatever were, you know, the, the way the uh, African continent was colonialized by European powers, if you understand that, then you always sort of, I think, gun automatically for what should be there, but it has to be stated. The uh, peoples that actually lived or live in Africa were most certainly not following the rather straight lines, you know, that were afterwards established by colonial powers. Now, that is important, but... I think the answer gives us a pretty good glimpse into why they are the way they are. You can already see if, if you know the colonial borders, except for Sokoto and whatnot, but you can basically see where the colonial borders of the colonial powers would start and where they would finish, at least roughly. Let's take a look at this. Since Victoria 3 has the concept of decentralized nations, we're able to model a large number of such countries on, for example, the African continent. The only empty spaces in Africa is now inhospitable. Impassable regions like the Deep Sahara, all other parts have countries, resources and pops. The border is another matter, because v Victoria 3 has fixed state region borders, although the states within a state region can be mutable. We've had to draw those lines somewhere, and to ensure it's possible to end up with a historical map, we have in some cases had to draw the line along colonial borders. There is a compromise here. Let's start with a compromise related to state regions. If you followed the channel, then you will know that I've already been a bit, you know, on the uh, side where I'm peeved by the way that it is implemented, then it was changed. What the ultimate result is, I don't know yet. But um, states and state regions, state regions are exactly what they are. You know, Texas, for example, the US states are also state regions. So the historical, the current US states are also state regions. And you can't change that. But within a state region, you can have different states. So there, there is some flexibility there, right? But ultimately, what has to be said is that the state regions here were clearly drawn so that if you were to colonize it exactly the way it was done in real life, you could get exactly the right result. Now, the other side of that coin is 
that that also means that the tribes that, you know, the peoples that really didn't live within these borders that were much more stretched out, that were, for example, in different positions, they have to follow borders that aren't theirs. And I will say, as it stands, um, decentralized nations. So we, just as a reminder, we have recognized nations, which are, for example, European nations, which are the American nations. And then we have unrecognized nations. They can be played. They do have the normal access to the tools that other nations also have access to, but they are unrecognized. You need to do something about it. And then there are decentralized nations. They are technically also unrecognized, but they will never be recognized because they don't have game mechanics attached to them in that sense. They basically exist so that you can start colonization, that you can do something there. And I will say, I anticipate that at some point, and I would say maybe within a year or within two years of Victoria 3 being out, because this seems something like something that should be fairly soon, right, after it comes out. Um, I anticipate that we will be seeing decentralized nations as playable, that you can do something about it, that you can, you know, attempt to uh, basically create your own fortune with it. But until then, since it is basically a filler for colonization, that is exactly what the current mechanic is. Since it is basically that, I personally do not mind their borders to be inaccurate, their borders to not really, really depict anything, because ultimately they just depict it so that you can follow the colonization process that you want to do. Um, I am fine with that, but as soon as we are talking about decentralized nations actually getting the mechanics that they deserve, uh, which they surely do, but you have to make cuts somewhere, and let's be really, it's not the exact focus of this time period of this game, um, but as soon as they get their mechanics, I do think there needs to be a lot more detail in there that currently isn't represented. So yeah, basically, I understand what they did here. We have on the one side the European powers. We have, I mean, also the uh, powers such as, uh, you know, Japan, uh, China, if they were to West, uh, to uh, uh, become recognized, that would all be viable and then they could also be active there. But on the flip side, of course, again, an underrepresentation of the decentralized nations, but I think that is just uh, something that happens when you make cuts in video games where you say we need to cut the feature here or else we're going to be Star Citizen tomorrow and we can't have a feature creep. So yeah, I get where they're coming from. I am very happy. And you can see it on the map behind as well. I'm very happy that they are saying that the Sahara is inhospitable, so it is blocked off. I do remember, uh, I mean, Victoria 2, of course, didn't really play around with, uh, you know, uh, inhospitable land. But Hearts of Iron 4 released without the Sahara being blocked off and you had these campaigns where the Italians <laughs> would just go through Chad and, and into the Congo, right? It was ridiculous. Um, the fact that they have accounted for that here is uh, is good news. They, they have learned from the past. Um, that is definitely good news. I, I very much welcome this and yet the map is still colored in there. So it does apparently have uh, basically, you know, wasteland that plays nice, if you will. I, I like that. I am a big fan of this. Let's move on. So, are there any reasons why the centralized African countries at GameStart wouldn't colonize the continent ahead of other countries? So, uh, you see, for example, Sokoto, you see Wadai, you see the countries in Ethiopia, of course, those are all centralized and they could theoretically take over territory. That is a valid concern in the sense that I have seen smaller and bigger issues be neglected by game development, you know, where it only becomes apparent once the game is actually released, but the answer here is quite clear. Colonization takes a bit of financial and bureaucratic, a bureaucratic investment to progress at all. Investment that those countries don't start off with and that are unlikely to get early on in the game, among other factors. So I do like this, because what is being said here? What is being said is not A, you know, the game will be broken and the centralized African countries will blob, blob, blob. That is not being said. What is also not being said is they can't do that. If you play Sokoto, if you play Egypt, if you play Wadai, if you play any of the other countries, you're looking at a situation where if you build up the bureaucracy, if you build up the financial investments that you can then bring, if you build up the people that you need to actually migrate there so that you can make it into a colonial state, you can pull it off. And I like to hear that. Uh, should it make you into a world power? It sh certainly should be hard. It's like playing Belgium to a degree or like playing the Netherlands. You will not be Prussia. You will not be the United Kingdom, right? You need to play your cards right. But that is the thrill of this gameplay. And the fact that this is available, that this is possible, and that the player, and maybe a very fortuitous AI, if the player, for example, were to help them, right? If they were to invest in them, if they were to give them aid, that that can succeed, I'm very, very happy about to hear. That, that is something, honestly, that sounds like the right vision for me. So, yeah. There you go. All right, here's the next one. Are you able to directly change laws in your puppet states? You cannot dictate which laws your subjects could have, but in those cases where we have diplomatic place to force something to change it, the AI is very prone to just give in to your demands. So 
We had an example for this. Um, in particular, I, I think if you have, for example, a vassal, if you have a somebody that you know is within your sphere of influence and they are not forbidding slavery. We had that example in particular, you know, for for example, uh, the, the Great Britain. Great Britain, of course, had a big campaign at this historical time period uh, where they went and said, "Okay, slavery is bad. We want to stop it everywhere. We we're going to intercept Brazilian slavery ships and so on and so forth. We're not going to support the CSA. You know the drill." I like the fact that we can do this with our puppets as well, but it has to be said, the Wogol selection is quite limited. This means that if one of your puppets says, okay, I'm gonna pass a law that, I don't know, makes it so that uh, children need to work, right? Child labor. And you already banned that, and you don't want that. I don't think there's going to be a Wogol. Slavery as a Wogol, if your puppet decides to go communist, which... It probably won't do peacefully, so there will likely be a civil war in which you can then already intervene. But if they were to turn out communist, right, you would have a situation where you could intervene. Because regime change as such does exist. But I do think it is fairly limited, and I don't necessarily think that that is bad. If you want to have more influence, you need to go all the way and say, hey, I will annex you. You will be a part of me, this is direct rule. There's no other way, because historically speaking, we're not looking at a situation where many, many laws, you know, that, for example, were passed in the Commonwealth. And it also has to be said uh, that Great Britain at the time sort of wanted the Commonwealth to be independent because the little Englanders, you know, in the, in the Whig uh, party, they basically felt very strongly that the Commonwealth kind of should shut up <laughs> and should take care of themselves while uh, Great Britain can enjoy its hegemony, of course. But there is a, a, a precedent here, I think, where... If you really want full investment, where you really fully want to control something, you need to annex it. That's just that's just the way it is. Uh, until you annex it, they can pass laws. The ultimate way of saying you can't have those laws is always annexing it. I do, I, I will say, I do hope that, uh, especially when it comes to war goals, which ultimately is, right, the diplomatic play, that's how you started. Um, I do hope that there will be more vassal-specific war goals, where it basically could be, hey, I need your mint to serve, you know, for example, in my army, and, and that gives me uh, the option to build a barrack, for example, in your territory, and that is then under my direct control, or something else, for example, right, again, to child labor, to vo voting rights, and so on and so forth, I do think that would be very interesting if we actually got those specific interactions just for our vassals. I would be a big fan. Alright, will colonization for literally unsettled land like some Pacific Islands be different than other forms of colonization? No, we've really just lumped the actually uninhabited la land into decentralized nations as if it's uh, as it's honestly not significant enough to justify distinct mechanics for it. So this is an expected uh, turn of events. We've had, uh, I think about a year ago at this point, we've had this post from Liana where she basically was talking about that there are two ways of colonization. The first way is going against an unrecognized nation. Remember, unrecognized nations like Japan, Persia, China, uh, uh, Dai Viet and so on, they are playable, but they are not recognized by the international theater of powers. And you can colonize them by declaring colonial wars, be it to just take a state, be it to make them into colonial protectors. We talked about that in a different dev diary, of course, as well. But then there are also decentralized nations. And everything that isn't unrecognized and isn't recognized will be within those decentralized nations. So even if there is a piece of land that is literally empty, it will basically be stored in unrecognized nations. And the answer, or rather the, the impulse here as to why that is the case, is that there is no empty land and there is basically the mechanic that approaches unrecognized and nation colonization similar to empty land. Because what happens is you institute something that brings settlers from you into a specific province in that province, then you have your settlers. The more settlers there are, the more the progress is, the more will you be able to have this land. Again, I'm sourcing all of this from Liana's post. This may have changed at this point in development, but I wouldn't know. We haven't really talked about development. Uh, sorry about... Uh, colonies in the in any of the dev diaries that we had but yeah the the idea there appears to be that whether it is populated or not doesn't really matter because the unrecognized nation deals with it all the same you come into their influence they know there's an island there for example they know something's going on and you're saying this is my island now if they resist this could mean war and if they win they will kick you out if they lose then you might even take more right but the base idea is that you treat both of these land examples the same way this is all via migration and colonization i think we're gonna uh, see that pop up even further down the line. All right, here's the next one. Will we be able to outfit Arctic expeditions like the Franklin expedition to find the Northwest Passage? There are expeditions, hang tight, and we'll go into detail about them in the future. So we have seen expeditions in the new screenshots as well. I hope that I'm putting that up right now. Um, we have seen those, we don't know how they work, but they appear to be in a greater 
more like a questline almost uh, sort of condition than they were in Victoria 2 where you, yes, I make the investment and then you wait and hope that RNG blesses you. Uh, I'm a big fan of the expansion there, but what exactly that means, hey, we'll have to find out. All right, and this brings us to the second topic of today. So this is about warfare now, and warfare is pretty fresh, I think, in everybody's mind. There's, of course, you know, the pillars of warfare. We have the cost of warfare, naval, then the army, the strategic overview rather than the tactical or slash operational maneuvering and whatnot. That is, uh, I think, quite fresh because, you know, it's, it's been very, very recent. But I do think that the more information we have on a topic this contentious, the better it is, because the better can we talk about it. So, let's do all of these questions and answers. Is there anything preventing you from declaring war on a nation than just permanently occupying them, like ticking infamy for refusing to end an already won war? Yes, I'm go going to copy what I wrote in the piece Dev Diary. My current thinking on this is, if the player is occupying their war goals and is able to keep their war support high, eventually the enemy will capitulate and the war will end. Makes sense. Because uh, if you occupy your war goals, then it will go to minus 100 for the enemy, but not for you. If the player themselves is prevented from going below zero war support because they have unassailable war goals and using this to keep the war going forever, the AI should be willing to drop those war goals. So this is very important, actually. Um, since the new diplomatic play, the warfare itself, and then the negotiation of the back and forth peace deal is as modular as it is, if you have a war in which you crush the enemy, except, for example, you can't reach X or Y state, you can't reach that country, so you can't get that war goal under control, if that were to happen, you could drop that war goal, and then capitulation is totally possible, completely doable. Um, I do think that that is a very good stance, because it does make it both so that the player can get a result out of their war if they are the aggressor, or, how it is in the example, if the player is the defendant, the AI can drop a war goal and say, that's fine, we, we don't get that, but we get the entire rest, because we have all of that under control. This does most certainly sound to me as though it will be very effective in stopping cheese, and I'll be honest with you, as much as I... Listen, I, I talk about this and I don't th think I talk about this enough because you can't talk about this enough. I love ambition in game design. It's, it, it's what I just completely endorse. And I will tell you, ambitious systems though, you always need to be wary. You always need to assume that there are a thousand ways of exploitation that you just don't know about yet. And I, I do think that this peace system, as modular as it is, as uh, dynamic as it is, that it could come with severe difficulties to actually not be extremely cheesable, but this is a good consideration. This keeps something under control that otherwise would be rampant. The way people would play around with it, the people would delay wars. We see it, I think, both in Stellaris and EU4 itself, uh, the way players do it. So, big fan of them approaching it from this perspective. Uh, number three, I'm considering adding it so that war goal, uh, so that a war goal that a country is unable to occupy eventually gets automatically dropped. Yeah, I, no, I love it. Th this is good. Uh, this is Wiz, by the way, answering this directly. This would basically mean that it's impossible for wars to go on forever. Eventually, a resolution of some sort would be forced. I do think um, this entire concept of making it so that wars will end and that there is a cost to war that forces you and or the AI to end it, I do think that this ultimately is something that isn't really a revolution, very ambitious still, but that is more a direct uh, uh, follow-up result from what has been done in Stellaris. Stellaris with war exhaustion and the way it works very, very much pushes both the player and the AI into this exact direction. So yeah, um, ultimately, cheese will be, uh, will be there, I'm absolutely certain, but the way they are approaching it is a direct development coming from previous games here. When it comes to the peace deal and the uh, achievement of getting people to sign peace deals, right? Um, that that just comes from Stellaris and, and whatnot. So this isn't necessarily untested waters, I think. Right, this one is one that I love. Can we play as rebels in some events? Yes, there's a variety of both events and mechanics where you can choose to be the rebels and fight against your own country. Obviously, you wouldn't be the country anymore. Ah, uh, technically, I mean, you could be if it is an actual civil war between, for example, the monarchists and the communists, but the example you're given you will be a different country. L l let's take a look at this. To give one example, if the Sepoy Rebellion, so that is a rebellion uh, that happened in uh, India while it was still under the control of the East Indian Company, and the result of the war, the fact that it happens, was that only specific sections, sp specific ethnicities within the Indian subcontinent were allowed in the army uh, because they were treated as trustworthy by the British, and more importantly, um, the 
East Indian Company, of course, completely lost uh, control of everything. Britain came and took it over. Uh, if you play the Sepoy Rebellion, you can possibly switch to them and fight for Indian freedom. Very, very interesting, of course, the Sepoy Rebellion uh, in itself, a very interesting topic, you know, the way it started, where they had a uh, new grease for their guns, and the Muslims uh, within the army believed that it was uh, pig grease, so, you know, pig fat, and the Hindus in the army believed that it was uh, cow fat, and both of them were very upset about it. It's, it's one of the most interesting for me personally beginnings of a revolution because it is something where you can really see the absolute mismanagement that came from the east indian company you don't often see that because most of the time these sort of minor quote-unquote reasons are alleviated by the actual rulership now um this is important to state because when we think about victoria 2 when we think about eu4 when we think about basically i mean Anything other than Hoi 4. Uh, Imperator Rome, as much as I love where the game is at at 2.0, I will say I dislike a lot that if you have a civil war, you either win it or it's game over. I think that sucks. I think that's a really bad solution. Uh, not that it's going to be changed. You know, I mean, they, they did. <laughs> I still mourn Imperator Rome, okay? But basically... Um, I do think that this is the right approach. We see it in Hoi 4 as well, where you can, of course, be on the other side, depending on where you go with the Focus 3. It should be much more dynamic with Victoria 3, because rebellions should be much more common than they are in the very small time frame of Hoi 4. Overall, I'm very happy with the fact that they chose this approach. This wasn't a secret or anything, but I do like that they are confirming this, because this would also mean, hey, if the Sepoy Rebellion lets you, lets you play them, what about just a rebellion of, I don't know, the Hungarians within Austria-Hungary? Could I all of a sudden fight for Hungarian freedom? That would be so good. What if 1848 would be a success? I would love it. I, uh, I'm very eager to see rebellions and revolutions in generally explained. Now let's move on. Ah, here we have a question that I think um, isn't on the mind of many, but it is on the mind of people that are very dedicated. You have to respect that. That is something that you have to respect. How will multiplayer be skill-based in Victoria 3 when the microsystem now is gone? For example, can a minor nation win against a major power if they are skilled enough? A player just needs to utilize different talents in multiplayer, like people's skills and a real ability to, uh, to negotiate. <sighs> I hate the idea of me telling you you're playing the game wrong, because I don't think you are. If you are having fun, if you are having a good time, you're playing the game the right way. But you have to understand, you have to realize that there is a vision that the creators of the game have. You don't need to agree with that vision. That is okay. But if they didn't have a vision, they wouldn't be delivering a good game. That is one of the ground rules of creative work. You either have a vision or you are creating absolute garbage. That's the way it is. And I will tell you right now, um, I personally, of course, you know, it's easy for me. I agree with what the devs are doing. But I will tell you right now that uh, the vision of the devs simply is not StarCraft. The vision of the devs is simply to say it shouldn't be decided by who can click faster, by who can, uh, you know, get exactly the right locations. That's not how wars are. Now, the important part here is there still needs to be player engagement. I do think there is player engagement coming from, again, the diplomatic places that are so very important. Now, can you sway France to help you? Or will Prussia eat you? Can you sway Russia to stay out of the conflict? So that you can actually attack Qing, uh, the Qing Empire, or will they join and completely demolish you? These are the questions that need to be answered, rather than can I cycle in my troops, you know, in the mountains here, so that I can have a repeatedly uh, uh, ongoing fight in the mountains and actually just massacre you. Those are things, those are choices, those are decisions that are much more worthwhile. The other thing that needs to be stated, and I've seen the sentiment that um, at some point, I, I, I've seen it from like a couple of sources at the very least, that at some point they would introduce micro into the game system. I am telling you they're not going to do that. I haven't talked to them about this, I haven't asked them, but I'm telling you they're not going to do this. And the reason for that is that it is so vital that you take damage. That the big nation can assault the, uh, the smaller nation and has a high chance of winning, but will step out if they lose too many people. This isn't about actually annihilating the larger nation, because that never happened. It's a complete... That's ridiculous. This is about the larger nation saying, I am not having fun, I'm taking my ball, and I'm going home. That's what this is about. And if you don't have the cost of war, because you, again, cheese the AI or the other player into mountains and then cycled in, cycled out, you're not going to have that effect. And that is a massive, massive effect that is clearly a central part of the vision of the devs. And I, again, personally, I very much agree with this vision. 
What I'm interested in is not the war itself, it is the aftermath of the war. How are my people feeling about it? How are my dependents feeling about it? Do I have uh, more people that are com coming home from the war completely devastated, both mentally and physically, they can't work and so on and so forth, right? Those are the questions that I want answered because they are important for civilization building. What isn't important is the, the cheesing. That, that's not how civilization building works. Um, so basically what I'm trying to say is, if you're looking for something that isn't this, if you're looking for a system in which you, having admittedly the skill of recognizing when a position, a tactical and operational position is in favor of your, you know, of yourself, then this won't be your game. That's just as simple as it is. There are games in the world that aren't made for you. EU4 is not made for me. I don't enjoy it at all. Um, CK3 is basically made for me. I, I wish that the, the content updates, of course, came faster, but basically made for me. I love the roleplay plus map uh, map game angle that they are taking. I currently, as somebody that is playing Elder Kings 2, I can tell you right now, it fits so wonderfully. I, I recommend giving that a try, like the idea what CK3 is. And CK3 moved away from pure map gaming, from pure arcade as well. It moved more into the roleplay angle. Victoria 3 is doing the same thing. If you don't like that, then it sucks. I completely recognize that. I wish EU4 was like, uh, for me as well, but ultimately the situation is just, if they didn't have a vision, it would be worse. So yeah, I, I hope that uh, I, I basically clarified a bit, I think, why so many people, or rather, if you are one of the people that really, really want micro back, I hope I clarified why many, many people feel differently. I see a lot of hostility, in particular from the micro, com uh, micro community, and I can get that because if you really like something and that is gone, you are angry. I understand that. doesn't justify it, of course, but I understand that. And I will tell you right now, maybe you can see the other side, you know, with this angle a bit more. Now, let's move on. Ah, here we are. With diplomatic plays in mind, how are you planning to handle event wars? For example, wars that would likely be a result of an event or event chain. Examples being Commodore Parry's expedition, the British demand that led to the Opium War, or the Ems uh, dispatch, so uh, to, you know, that started the Franco-Prussian War. Will these types of historical events be instant wars that skip diplo plays, or will they start unique diplo plays of, of, uh, of a sort? We handle these in two principal ways. Either largely through AI-guided mechanics, in the case of Paris Expedition, there's a diplomatic play to force a country to open market, Japan being forced to open its market, is one of the ways the Meiji Restoration can start. Very, very interesting, because that is incredibly, incredibly dynamic. Um, one of the ways, first of all. Second of all, if it does happen, you are in a situation where you then could reform, but you don't have to. Uh, there, there are many different gameplay angles here that I would love to explore. I would love to play uh, Japan just because it is one of the larger, one of the stronger unrecognized nations. You know, it, it gives you a really interesting uh, position there. Or it can be done through events that fire if it makes sense for them to fire. Taiping is such an example. You're not guaranteed to have a Taiping Rebellion, but there is an event chain for it if the conditions are there. Um, this example is a bit of an odd one, which I mostly mean, what, what I mostly mean by that is that we're talking about a rebellion here, right? And we don't know how that works in the first place. Um, I would be interested, I don't think, oh man, it would be interesting, right? If you had rebellions, so for example, we, we've already seen the rebellion count in one of the more recent screenshots, and let's say you have a rebellion, it's brewing, and then a diplomatic play starts, and they actually can ask, hey... We're the communists rebelling. Soviet Union, would you like to send us weaponry? Would you like to support us here? I would like that a lot. I don't think that's how it works, but again, we don't know actually how it works. But yeah, rebellion being event-driven, being scripted without a diplomatic play, of course, makes a lot of sense. I do wonder whether there are any wars that actually, like, outside wars is what I mean, right? Like the Franco-Prussian War, whatever else there is. Uh, I do wonder whether that is something that can actually occur just without events, or whether there are any events to begin with. I, I don't have an answer, but this is definitely a really, really interesting response by Wiz nonetheless. Will the Great Games, so that is uh, for Persia and Afghanistan, and for example, the lead-up to the first Sino-Japanese war, or rather any proxy conflicts, be ref uh, rep represented somehow? We don't have any specific references to these events in the current build of the game, maybe in the future, but the Great Game itself, of course, was a major inspiration for the diplomatic play and interest system, so... Um, there is something to be said here that I don't think is in this round of questions. Um, I, I put that into a different category, it's going to come later. But they did talk a lot about the modability and the options that you will and should have based on who your country is, what your country is made up of, and what they will prefer in war. And that should lead into the Great War. Whether it does is a different question. Whether these systems work out exactly the way they imagine it will 
completely different topic. Never expect perfection. You shouldn't do that. But, you know, of course, the system itself is designed around this. What do I mean? If you're Great Britain, for example, if you are interested in your uh, uh, Indian holdings, if you're interested in Iraq, for example, you say, I want Persia so that Russia can't have the uh, warm water port, then you might want to go in there. Right? If Russia is, for example, your rival or you just were antagonized quite a bit or you said, I want control in this region, it's my strategic interest and Russia has amassed too much threat, the AI of, Brit uh, of the British should say, I will take a, ch a chunk out of Afghanistan, for example, right? Uh, whether you succeed, I mean, hey, <laughs> historically it was quite the gruesome war for them, of course, as well in the 19th century also. But uh, this general topic is something that I would like to bring up in the sense that what they're saying here isn't, we just didn't implement that and nothing's going to happen. It's more that if the AI weighing does pan out, they should care for it, right? Uh, I like the fact that they have this generalized mechanic, but we'll see whether it works. Th that's my stand on that. How moddable will war goals be? Will it be possible to add war goals to let you take individual provinces outside of treaty posts instead of whole states? That's a big topic, of course, for me as well. Whether you can uh, take individual, in, individual uh, states, uh, sorry, provinces, because we have the situation right here where Pomerania in uh, Prussia is uh, both Mecklenburg for Pommern, so the modern state, and then it is in the east, it is the actual Pomerania. And while that makes sense in the historical context, you can't actually have uh, an order nicer uh, border as we have it today because it's one state and if you can only or it's one state region and if you can only take the state entirety in in that region then you can never actually split it properly i don't know uh let's take a look at what they have right here war goals are unfortunately like the one thing in the game that is not very moddable right now because of the complex backend logic governing them that is something that's on my personal uh, personal to improve list uh, as i think there's a lot of potential for adding interesting modded war goals i hope they get that done before release I hope they get that done before release, or they get enough Wargolds in so that it's not a major issue, although it will be an issue, I can tell you that right now, there will always be a modder that comes up with something that is like not anticipated by the developers. Uh, the way I just see it is when I look at the potential mods that are being made, you know, I mean, uh, what, what really comes to mind for me is, uh, you know, the, the topic of, for example, Sunless Sea. Really, really hoping that they are going through with that mod project to actually have basically the normal world map and then the underneath, you know, the Untersee. Uh, because that would be really cool. I would play the hell out of that. But I also think that, especially in the Untersee, you're going to have war goals that aren't normal. You know, whether it is like sort of hegemony war goals, whether it is like war goals for uh, souls, for the entrance to the Mediterranean, for example, uh, that sort of stuff. That's that's a question that is really difficult to answer. I don't think that uh, all of the war goals that we have in vanilla would cover that. So yeah, I certainly hope that they fill this, uh, you know, before they release the game. Will there be some way to peacefully resolve diplomatic plays by offering a compromise? At the moment, there's only backing down. I'm considering negotiated solutions along the same principles as peace deals, but it's more complicated because of factors such as the limited time and nature of plays compared to wars, so we'll see. Um, so that is about the topic of actually getting a compromise basically in a diplomatic play. At that point, I do think you could call it a diplomatic conference, which makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, it's not a complete backing down, it could just be an exchange, did happen historically as well. I hope they implement it. That, that, that's as simple as it is. I, I do think the system that we currently have, you can totally have a viable campaign, you know, where you don't need that system. But I do think especially with smaller nations, especially with nations where many greater powers have strategic interests in. Let's take, for example, the Balkans. If we have the Balkans, it would be neat. Or let's take, for example, Africa, right? The Congo, that's one of the better examples, I guess. But if we look at that, um, I think it would make it more possible to survive as a minor nation if you didn't have to fully back down, if you could find a compromise, if you had enough support of, you know, other powers so that the power that is attacking you is sort of backing down, that sort of stuff. And I also think it would be good for great powers so that they could come to compromises via uh, conferences rather than, okay, well, I guess 1860, it's a world war. <laughs> Everybody joins in on the Ottoman Empire, let's do it. Uh, I, I hope that this makes it in, no doubt. When do big nations like France, Prussia and Austria actually get in on diplomatic plays? How does the game determine it? 
I'm assuming this is about when the AI decides to join a player rather than when it's possible for them to do so. The gist of that is to join a side. Uh, the gist of it is that to join a side, an AI has to either want strongly either to back a side or be tempted with something that it wants enough. Or it wants depends on which AI strategi uh, strategies is governing it at the moment. AI strategies is what uh, I talked about earlier. To overcome both their desire to support the opposing side and their desire to stay neutral. I'll go more to this in AI dev diaries in the future. This is, yeah, this is the, the bread and butter. This is the potatoes and meat of this, okay? This is where you sit down and say, this system looks really, really good, but you need to make it work. I hope they make it work. Hey, this is this is like the biggest topic, you know? I, I can't really add much more, but I want to have you be aware, as, as aware as I am, that if you try to do great things, there's a greater chance of screwing it up. Sitting down and reiterating an old system that has been done a thousand times, easy to do. Balancing out diplomatic plays that have never been done, tough to do. Very tough to do. In CK3, for example, uh, funnily enough, if I, I... I do this so often. If I'm at war with another faction, or with anybody really, right? And I'm like, oh, I need, I need an alliance real quick, I need to call them in. The AI will not calculate in at all whether they would like to join my war when they sign that alliance. And afterwards, it's very easy in CK3 to just get somebody to join your war. So these are two separate considerations for them. In this one, it's basically together. You try to promise them something, you know, in CK3, it's the alliance, it's the actual marriage, that is what you promised them. And they immediately realize, oh, wait a minute, but I would possibly have to go to war against Prussia right? They understand that, and I think that is a really big step that could be difficult. Let, let's hope that they put it uh, put it in and really implement it well. Can the war support affect the efficiency of your government and army? Or like with a very low su war support, instead of knocked out of the war, you have a very high possibility to have a rebels like Russia, uh, to have rebels like Russia in World War One. No, at the moment there is no such effect. It's an interesting idea, but it has some potentially severe impacts on balance, like having countries crumble when their war support starts getting low, so there's no need for a negotiated peace ever. So, I will say I don't really... So, I like the idea, first of all, for the army, that it influences the army. I do think uh, uh, that this was a bigger topic in World War One and World War Two, of course, you know, uh, where <clears throat> the war just lasted so long that people got frustrated, uh, the... German term is Wertzersetzung, which is a very uh, difficult term as well, but basically it means that you are agitating against the success of the armed forces in the eye of the regime that you are serving in. I think that you don't need a special system for the government trust, because this will already happen. Your population, if the war is prolonged, will get unhappy. Yes, your war support is also dropping, right? And it, it's, drops, it, it's dropping more and more the unhappy your population is. But if, you're up, if your population is unhappy, what does that mean? That means they might become radicals. That means they might rebel. This is already in. That's at least my point of view. What are the effects of war to infrastructure? Is it possible for some buildings and railways to get damaged? War does not damage buildings, including railways, directly. But it does inflict devastation, which impacts how the existing buildings function. After, after the war, this devastation will dissipate gradually as the other country rebuilds. We did it this way to ensure players wouldn't need to keep track of everything that be destroyed during the war to rebuild it manually. And it also creates a better record of how badly a state has been affected, so it's apparent where the most amount of damage has been inflicted. I think this is the best solution. And I don't say this just because it sounds neat. I say this because I played a lot of Hearts of Iron 4 No Step Back recently. And as much as I endorse basically all aspects of that DLC and of that update, I hate it when, like, come on, they, like, the British come over and bomb one of my strategic regions for just a second. And all of a sudden, I have, like, 15 railway buildings that need to be repaired but are at the bottom of the of the queue and then at the top are the stuff that I'm currently building meaning I need to like manually put all of them up I hate it I hate it so much I think it's very bad design I think it sucks I don't think it's fun uh, I I'm very happy to see that they're basically going with this this is damaged you need to invest into something but it is a natural automatic process that happens and your resources will be spent there right you you go into this devastation I don't want a high 4 situation. I love the Officer Corps. I wish we had it in Vicky 3. We will not be having it. That comes up later, sadly. 
Uh, I, I, I love no step back, but that sucks so much. So yeah, very thankful that that isn't in. Let's move on. How will it transition from a post-Napoleonic discrete army movement to World War I full front wa warfare be modeled in game? I remember reading in one of the dev diaries that one of the approaches would include the speed with which fronts change, but is there anything else currently planned? There's a number of different stats that change at different technological tiers that are intended to shape how front lines move over time and how the war progresses. We'll get into more detail around that once we talk about battles more in depth in the dev diary. The most tangible metric is how much territory changes hands when armies are impacted by different technologies though. Um, yeah, so basically the last part here in particular, so changing hands, they did, I, I think I understood that very well at least, where basically if you have more people at a front, right, so that they can come in and like can defend and make it so that you can't proceed fast, then you might only take one or two provinces. If you have these big armies and an entire big army gets defeated, then you will take a lot of land until that army recovers and is back in use. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that is very good. But of course, there is a big question here. How do battles actually happen? What are battles? How do they proceed? Uh, on that note, I do want to say that I found it quite interesting that they actually went ahead and showed warfare the way they did, you know, with uh, the, the state it is currently in, because a lot of it was mock-up art, a, a lot of it was just uh, uh, basically concept art to begin with, right? Uh, maybe some very early implementations, but I was very impressed by that, because honestly, they could have, like, not talked about war for another, I don't know, two, three months. It certainly is a system in development. I'm eager to see where it's going, uh, but yeah, I mean... Honestly, we just don't know enough to really talk about the battles as it stands. Right, so the question here is a bit confusingly, uh, uh, you know, articulated, but what it's basically asking is, can we manually assign troops from barracks to generals? Not directly, because that may not be the ideal situation for the player anyway. Let's say a general joined you 40 years ago and is now your most senior accomplished guy, but now you have to ta uh, ha have tanks and airplanes, yet he refuses to use it because he's good with horses. However, since we assign units such that they come from as few buildings as possible, you can do the reverse. See which buildings supply his troops and reconfigure them to make the kind of battalions he's most comfortable with. There's two aspects here that I like. First of all, um, obviously the part, you know, of a... Uh, barracks try to send the units just to one general, you can still specialize them in a way that is beneficial for the general, it, it works, it fits, I can accept that. And then the other part is of course the notion that you can have, and that this is something that they have considered as a gameplay element, a general that is sort of the old guard, that is sort of outdated. I wish this would go into an officer core like mechanic, like Hearts of Iron 4, but I am already happy that, you know, A, in EO4, for example, yeah, in EO4, you like to have a good general that is like, you know, has, has sixes everywhere, everywhere, that sort of stuff. But like, let's be really, a, don't really care about your generals. If there is a situation where I would keep this old guard general with me, I like it. Because that is both at the start, especially a boon, and then later on, a real issue. I like that it adds a lot of actual gameplay value to uh, you know, generals rather than just being modifiers. Big fan. In the cost of war, Dev Diary, you mentioned devastation will lead to increased migration and pop mortality. Is it possible for us to get a measure of how many of our people have moved away, died as a result of war? I think it would help us decide when a war is too much as opposed to just seeing military casualties. While it is not impossible, we show migration and population statistics, I do not believe that we currently break down this statistic to show that what caused the migration and or mortality specifically to a minute, de a minute detail, because there are so many possible effects, plus lag effects, etc. So you should be able to look at the demographics of your country and see the correlated number of such statistics, aka, I saw 200,000 increase in deaths and I know X number of troops died, but how much was from devastation is for you to make educated guesses on. I wish civilian deaths were featured within the actual war statistics. I believe we talked about this, or they talked about this as well in the aftermath of the, uh, uh, you know, Dev Diary on the cost of war, where they talked about, yes, we are currently not really talking about civilian statistics, uh, you know, related to your war support. I wish they did that, because those are the relevant ones. And I think this really coincides with the devastation question as well. Is war support calculated for each war individually, or are all wars a country is involved in? For example, say I am Austria fighting Russia for Poland, and things aren't going great, and I'm at plus 50% war support. If Italy then declares on me for Venice, do I start at plus 50% in that war, or plus 100%? War support is calculated individually per war, though doing badly in one war can definitely result in your war support going down faster in another, as factors such as your population being starving and miserable as a result of one war impacts the other. Honestly, makes sense. I, I think this is just a really good point. Wanted to share this with you. 
Is it possible that a stronger participant of diplomatic plays can take control over it or become war leader if diplomatic plays leads to war? Currently, only if they're the overlord of the main participant, as I don't think players would find it terribly fun to have control seized away from them every time they play a minor. And also, it's a lot less important who is a war leader with a peace who is war leader with a peace negotiation negotiation system we have in Victoria 3. Remember, you don't need to be the war leader to block a peace deal. If you're the negotiator, if you're any negotiator, you can say, no, I won't accept this until you give me X or Y or until you drop X or Y. There is a case that could be made for things like Serbia not leading the Entente in World War One, but as a general rule, we don't want to uh, always wrest control away from miners. Again, it doesn't fully matter. I am curious, though, um, because, yeah, it, it makes sense. Serbia isn't the war leader in World War One, but if they were to collapse, if they were to capitulate, they would get a peace treaty and then a new war leader is chosen. That is how it was explained in the in the dev diary. So I think this issue sort of takes care of itself. Will navies have some use during peacetime? Instead of getting stuck in port, can we use them to, uh, to do gunboat diplomacy or to safeguard trade routes? In the current build of the game, navies are only used in peacetime for generating substantial amounts of prestige and act as a soft deterrent in diplomatic plays. The, it's a very soft deterrent, right? Because like they don't actually take into account whether my navy is in front of your coast on the other side of the world. It's a like a very generously soft uh, deterrent right there. Uh, but we're experimenting with some peacetime uses similar to what you uh, what you are discussing. We'd really like to see peacetime use of your navy in game. Yes, please. Yes, please. Make it have purpose that I have stations in X and Y. That people can consider this, that I can consider this if other nations have it. If I'm Japan and the US are like, we have a navy and we can invade you, but their navy is in the Mediterranean, why would I care, right? Big, big topic. I, I, I need this. I want this. Will royal diplomacy, royal marriages, personal unions, royal claims, etc. play a role in diplomacy? Personal unions in the game are set up for and are considered legacy effects with their diplomatic implications, but they are not something that can actively be created other than through event. I wish it weren't so. You could get around this as a modder, you could have a very specific war goal that then triggers an event every time you win it, where that, you know, where you get a personal union, but yeah, in general, this makes sense for the vanilla game, but you can't really, you know, like, move the game, for example, into, like, the year 1600 anymore, because all of a sudden, it doesn't apply. One of the major me uh, game mechanics is gone, so I do hope gonna see at least some flexibility there sooner rather than later. Would we be able to control the country's war doctrine and by that control how our generals approach war? Not talking about microing the generals, but more the general strategy they will take. So this sort of feels like a mixed approach between an officer corps and officer uh, école de guerre, right? So a, a school of war where you are educated on uh, what is the current doctrine of the, of, the, uh, of the country that I've asked for repeatedly, <laughs> and general strategic guidance. Let's take a look at what they have to say. The approach we've taken so far is that the player is in charge of which generals to hire from a limited pool, promote and retire. And the traits those generals have will affect how they approach war in various ways. You can also customize how your army behaves through some tech and production methods and determine the broad composition of your army via the army model laws. Aside from that, some sort of overall countrywide doctrine that affects how your war's progress is not currently the plan, but also not ruled out for the future, if we want to add even more agency. It's something we think would fit well with our approach. Please, 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 I beg of you. I know, listen, I know this isn't coming before before release. I, you know, it, at least I, I, listen, if they do it, I would be very surprised, but I don't see it. Um, But I will say, having a military culture form could significantly enhance how generals are interwoven with society. Yes, they are interest group members, but primarily you currently would fire somebody, you know, unless they're amazing, you of course would keep them in, you know, but like if they're just like your average guy, you only kick them out if you know the interest group can handle it. But there is something to be said for even your average guy being able to develop a doctrine, then being able to go to the school of war, right, to the university and teach a new doctrine. That is the sort of stuff that I want. I would really love it tied in. I would really love it if the generals could be sent, for example, to Japan as well. I talked about this at length. I just want to say, like, I talked about this at length in a different video. I really just want to say, please, 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 please. I really love the new approach of the warfare system. I personally have desired this for years and years and years and years. Uh, less micro cheese and more strategic thinking. But please, military culture. I beg you. Uh, honestly, like, this is one of, this is my biggest thing about warfare. The rest is like, it, I, it can pass, you know, like, even the Navy, I had a lot to say about it, but the Navy always lands where it needs to land, you know, with the results, with where you place your Navy and so on. But man, military culture, that's something that I miss, for sure. 
Will it be possible for nations to join a war after it has already started, like how it happened in World War I, for example, with Italy? For release, we only intend to have countries able to join wars already in progress if someone's sovereignty is being violated. So, for example, if you go through Belgium, if you send your thugs through Belgium, which is actually interesting because it would imply, possibly, if I guarantee the independence of Belgium, that, that would pull in the UK, right? The Great Britain? At least I think so. While this covers some of the World War I situations of late joiners, we realize it doesn't cover everything. At the moment, this is a concession we're willing to make to ensure the diplomatic play system is impactful, but that doesn't preclude us adding other mechanics to support this in the future, if we can do it in a way that doesn't invalidate the focus on pre-war diplomacy. Um, just to sort of, obviously I want this in the game as well, right? Uh, to join later. But I do want to say it is of course important what they say here is completely right. If you basically have a situation where once the war starts, you can still promise things wildly back and forth, that sort of stuff, you invalidate the, the actual weight of the diplomatic play, the pressure that you feel as you engage in the diplomatic play and say, hey, I can promise you this, but I can't promise you that, right? If you undermine that, you get rid of the entire system's purpose. So yeah, I want this in as well, but I'd rather have the system than the extended feature because uh, as long as you still can have major wars and then those major wars be extremely terrible, that's a good that's a good time. Oh, and this brings us to the end of this video. Uh, it was a bit longer, just a tad bit longer than I thought, but I think we still are at a pretty good rate. Uh, you know I love to go through the details here. Let me know what you think, whether you disagree or agree with any of the emotional pleas that I have given here today. Uh, I thought it was quite the interesting Q&A. I will follow this up, of course, with different Q&A topics. In particular, what we have right here uh, are such topics as politics, you know, uh, cultures, and then some other stuff, some general dev questions and the economy. All that stuff will be covered here on the channel. Make sure to subscribe to uh, participate in the, com uh, in the conversation here on the channel. And yeah, for the moment, I will see you later. Alligator.